years ago, Larry King had Mother Teresa on his TV program, and he was interviewing her, and somehow the topic turned to the topic of prayer. And he was mesmerized by this godly woman, and so he said, well, when you pray, what is it that you say to God? And Mother Teresa said, well, nothing. I just listen to God. And Larry King said, well, what does God say to you? And she said, nothing. He just listens to me. (laughs) And Larry King had this perplexed and confused look on his face, and he said, "I I don't understand. And Mother Teresa said, if you don't understand, I don't know how to explain it any better than that. In this time of choices and decisions, of change and transition, rather than looking to the right or to the left, we have chosen to look upward. And we have turned our attention to the Almighty God and we lean on Him. And we may not always know what to say when we pray, but we're, we're learning. And we're learning that prayer is to be a conversation between two people who love each other. And the tragedy of our times is not unanswered prayers, it's unoffered prayers. It's the fact that we don't take advantage of this opportunity. And I hope that as we are talking about the Lord's Prayer each week, that it is motivating you to talk to God more frequently and conversationally. It would be so sad to spend five weeks dissecting this model prayer that Jesus prayed for us and not to grow in our prayer lives. Bob Allen uh, teaches a lot on the topic of prayer, and I like the way he puts it. He says, our sworn arch enemy knows his only hope is that followers of Jesus will not pick up their weapon of prayer. And so we are invited to spend time with the one who most of us claim is the king of our lives and who, who reigns in our lives. It was a number of years ago, I spoke in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for one of my preacher friends, uh, Rick Ashley. And the day before I was to to fly there, he called me and he said, hey, make certain you bring your golf clubs with you. He said, I'm trying to pull off a miracle. I said, okay, well, sure, tell me, what, what is it? He said, well, I'm trying to get you on Preston Trail Golf Club. He said, I've lived here 12 years. It's one of the most prestigious courses around the Dallas area. And he said, I've never been able to get on the course and, and play the course. Well, I said, I don't care where we play. I just would enjoy being with you. I got to Dallas. He had pulled some strings, and sure enough, somehow we got to play Preston Trail uh, Golf Club. Now, you have to understand something. The, The reason the course has such a rich heritage is because of the man who designed the course. The designer of the course back in 1963 was was a golfer by the name of Byron Nelson. And Byron Nelson is arguably the best golfer to ever play the game. Uh, To put things in perspective, you go back a few years ago when Tiger Woods was, was in the prime of his career and he was on a hot streak. One year he won five tournaments in a row. That hadn't happened in over 50 years. Well, back in 1945, Byron Nelson won 11 tournaments in a row. He lost by one stroke and then he went on to win the next three. I mean, he he was a machine who dominated the sport. And so part of the reason the Preston Trail is so rich in heritage is because everybody knows the designer, Byron Nelson. Well, Rick and I, we we played the course, and we had a blast. The greens were immaculate. Uh, The rough was incredibly rough. Uh, I I baptized numerous golf balls that day in, in lakes. Uh, The food at the clubhouse was perfect. I mean, it was just one of of those days. But that was not the highlight of my day. The highlight came that night when I preached at Rick's church. And after I finished preaching, I was out in the atrium. I was getting ready to go into a room to meet with their elders and their leaders and, and do a question and answer time. And as I was greeting people and heading to that room, an elderly gentleman came walking up to me and he extended his hand and said, good to meet you, Dave. I sure enjoyed your message. And as I shook his hand, my hand began to tremble because it was Byron Nelson. And my voice trembled as I said, well, I I sure enjoyed getting to play your golf course today, Mr. Nelson. And so for the next 10 minutes, I stood there in a lobby, and I talked to him about golf, uh, about his family, 
about the church and about Jesus Christ. And that became the highlight of my day. You see, it's, it's one thing uh, to play the course. It's something totally different to get to know the designer. And that is the opportunity that prayer affords for each and every one of us. We are invited and we have the opportunity to get to know the designer of the universe in an intimate fashion, to say to him, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom, not, not my kingdom, but, but your kingdom and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray, we get to know who God is. We build that relationship. When we pray, we invite the presence of God into our lives and, and God does his work. When we pray, we are inviting his influence and his power to come down and to take over a situation or a sickness, a predicament or a pain. And this week, as we continue our walk through of the Lord's model prayer, for us, we, we come to this phrase, give us this day our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. On the surface, it might sound a little abrupt. I mean, there's no please in front of it. There's no please give us. It's just, it seems like a demand. But remember, it's not the first words out of our mouth. We began our prayer with a proper focus on the one to whom we are praying. We began first with praise. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. We moved from praise to priorities, and we focused on your kingdom coming, your will be done. And we are acknowledging to God that you are the king, and so may your kingdom purposes be lived out in my life. And then from praise and priorities, now we move to provision, and that's where we camp out today. Give us today our, our daily bread. So let's read this together, uh, this portion of the Lord's Prayer at all of our campuses. Let's just read it in unison, verses 9 through 11. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And we'll stop right there. Maybe there's no please before it because we're part of his family. He's our father. That's why we call him father. And we can make such a simple, self-serving request. Max Lucado writes, our father has committed to care for us. We aren't wrestling crumbs out of a reluctant hand, but rather confessing the bounty of a generous hand. The essence of the prayer is really an affirmation of the Father's care, because our provision is his priority. And this model prayer is teaching us to look into the heart of God for our provision. And the Greek word that, that is found here that's translated, uh, give us our daily bread, that word daily, it's only used two times in all the New Testament. And of course, it's the two times where we find the Lord's Prayer for us. The shorter version in Matthew 6, the longer version in Luke 11. And it's this word right here. But you have to understand something. There are two different translations, two different ways that we could look at that word that's used. One meaning is to translate it daily. The other meaning is to translate it as the word needed. In other words, the prayer could read, give us today the bread that we need. It's a prayer for sustenance, not greedy abundance. And this phrase in the Lord's Prayer is more of a reference to our physical needs. And this part of the Lord's Prayer hits very close to home. It's when you say, give us today our daily bread, that phrase entails... Lord, help us with the bills that we can't pay. Put food on our table and make it stretch. This is for the newly divorced person wondering how they can provide for their family. This is for the homeowner whose repair bills are piling up. This is for the recent retiree who doesn't feel like they've got enough to live on. This is also for the person whose health is in question. This is also for the person whose marriage is hanging by a thread. And when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we're putting our needs, our nourishment, our provision squarely in the hands of a powerful God. We're re releasing control of one of the things we like to control most. 
We're letting go of something we often hold tightly to. And so today, I, I want to talk about two different commitments, and then I just want to make an application for you. Here's commitment number one from this section of the prayer. It's a commitment to dependence. Jesus teaches us that when we follow the pattern of this prayer, that we're saying that we depend on God. No, no matter how much you think you're the provider for your family, it's just not true. Don't, now, don't get me wrong. We're to work hard. We shouldn't be lazy. Scripture tells us to work hard, to earn our wages and our living. But let me be very clear. God owns it all. He's just letting you have some of it. And the Bible teaches us in the book of James that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. And so when we pray for God to give us our daily bread, we're acknowledging that he's the one who has it in the first place. And we're coming to him dependent for each meal, each bite, each dollar, each day. It's a daily dependence and an ongoing need. And the Christian life is built on dependence. It doesn't work any other way. And when Jesus mentions the word bread in his prayer, I think that in the minds of the people who are listening there, the Jewish people especially, they would immediately think of their ancestors, the Israelites, before they went in the promised land, wandering in the wilderness. And while they were there, God provided their daily bread through the manna that he sent from heaven for them each day. In fact, they were to go out and to collect enough bread for that day. And they were forbidden to collect any more than that. And if they tried to store up and stockpile, then God would spoil that amount. The only exception to that was that before the Sabbath, they would collect enough manna for two days' food so that they didn't have to work on that day. You see, God was wanting them to consistently turn to them, to him. God was wanting them to consistently turn to him. A little later in the Sermon on the Mount, in the same chapter, in Matthew chapter six, Jesus says in, in verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them, are you not much more valuable than they? Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that the truth? Jason Epperson on our staff says, worry is holding on to something that belongs in his hands. But we would rather become paralyzed at the prospect of potential problems than to enjoy today and just get enough of our basic needs met for that particular time. And life does its best to, to get us caught up in distractions that can force us into unnecessary frustration. Some of you worry, oh, I've got a doctor's appointment on Tuesday. Well, what if the doctor tells me that I, I have cancer? And your mind just jumps ahead. It's just a checkup, but your mind just jumps ahead. And if you're not careful, you'll become consumed with worrying so much about, about things that will never transpire. We get so consumed about the things in the distance that we, we never live in the moment. Someone said that, that worry is like a rocking chair. It's a whole lot of activity, but you don't go anywhere. Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. Give us the bread that we need. Nothing more, nothing less. And so we admit our dependence on you, Lord. But we are a selfish and impatient people. You might remember I, I cracked a couple of ribs uh, a few weeks back, and it took over six weeks for them to be completely healed and for me to be uh, physically able to return to normal activities. And uh, when Tim Tebow was here last month, I was about halfway through that recovering process and I was still in a lot of pain. And every hour when we come out here, when he would give me a hug, it's just like, oh, you know. So at dinner, uh, Beth said to me, did you tell Tim that you have a couple of broken ribs? And I said, no, no, I didn't, didn't tell him. So I said, Tim, did, did you ever have cracked ribs? And he said, oh man, 
He said, cracked ribs. He said, that is the most painful injury that I have ever had. He said, oh, it just, it wipes you out. And that made me feel so much better. I'm feeling like a stud for some reason you now. And, and I said, Tim, when were you able to, to play football again? And he looked at me and said, in, in the second half. <laughs> That didn't go the way I was hoping it would go. Uh, But my beautiful, kind-hearted wife, who always stands up for me, she said, well, Tim, uh, Dave preached a couple of times with cracked ribs. (laughs) Not quite the same. Uh, 300-pound man with a helmet aiming at your side. Uh, Preaching is more of a non-contact sport, usually. Um, But our tendency is that we want healing And we want it now. We want our physical needs met. And we want it now. We want the house to sell, the promotion to come, the proposal for marriage to take place. We want to see the broken bones healed. We want to see the marriage saved. And we want it today. And yet God says, well, I'll give you your bread for today. You just keep depending on me. Here's a second commitment. First is a commitment to dependence. The second is a commitment to contentment. This is a prayer of contentment. We're, we're not praying for God to give us everything we need to live comfortably for the next 30 years. We're not asking for luxury and abundance. Could God provide those things? Of course, if he wanted to, he could. Certainly. And sometimes he does. But in this prayer, we're simply asking for what we need today. And that will be enough. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And when we really are dependent on God to provide what we need, it moves us to a place of contentment. When we have enough trust to depend on him, we worry less and less about what we don't have and we start being grateful for what we do have. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of God. So give us what we need, Lord, our daily bread. And the prayer here echoes the sentiment that we can trust God to provide what we need and we can be content. You see, the Lord of creation loves to provide for his children. Another quote from Max Licato, the kitchen in God's house is no restaurant. It is not owned by a stranger. It is run by your father. It's not a place you visit and leave. It's a place to linger and chat. It's not open one hour and closed the next. The kitchen is ever available. You don't eat and then pay. You eat and say thanks. But let's be honest. The longer we are alive and the more we eat, the more we just kind of see bread as something that is boring and it's something that is is basic. I got a loaf of bread right here. And it'll look good to you. And you'll probably say, oh, that does look good. this This is the Rachel Ray segment of the sermon. Uh, but at my Love Where You Are Bible study group uh, the other night, I said, I want you to think about bread. And how many of you are like, well, yeah, some of them like, oh, some of them are avoiding it. But I said, now let's talk about the toppings. Let's talk about what you put on top of bread. Can we come up with a top five list? And my Bible study group, we, we get into some very deep spiritual discussions like this. And so they came up with the top five toppings to put on bread. Okay? How about this one? Strawberry jam. How many of you like strawberry jam? Isn't this an unbelievable? And if it tastes like your grandma's jam, it changes everything just in a heartbeat. And you put that on, on some bread, and all of a sudden, it's so good. Number two right here, this is my wife's favorite, Cracker Barrel Apple Butter. Yeah, okay, you can, yeah, I see that hand. God bless you. Right. <laughs> this stuff, when, when the server walks past, my wife will get some. About 10 minutes later, she'll say, can I get you for just one second? Any way we could get some more apple butter? Oh, sure. And she brings out more apple butter for her. It's delicious, right? Number three, though, 
Macaroni Grill is onto something, aren't they? Because what they do is that they don't have, have something that with the bread goes on top. Instead, they give you something you can sop, right? And so you put this stuff, and you, they come to your table, and they pour that out, this oil. And then I always love it when they get the pepper. I always wanted to do this. So. And they always say, you say stop, and they just keep on going, right? You know? And then you take that bread, and you just dip it in there. It's unbelievable. Macaroni Grill, they know what they're doing. If I had a crayon, I would write my name upside down for you right here, okay? <laughs> the fourth one, though, is, is probably my favorite because I used to always have it when I was a kid, and I'd come home from, from school, and once you see the shape of that bear, doesn't your life change, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's just unbelievable because what it does is it just changes the taste of the bread. And so I put that on, and man, I just would start pouring that stuff out. And I, I coat that puppy. I go all over that piece of bread. It's, there's nothing like it. And after I've done that for about 10 minutes, and I've just got it stacked up there, my mom would come walking in the kitchen, and she'd see me finishing up, and I'd look at her, and she'd always say the same thing. Would you like some bread with your honey? I'd say, maybe, <laughs> because it changes everything the second that honey starts to drip across that bread. Well, there's one more. I apologize. Cinnamon butter from Texas Roadhouse. <laughs> this is, and we had people storm the stage last hour when I pulled this out, okay? And you may not have been hungry when I started, but if you can talk them into giving you like two scoops, like you're getting ice cream, and then you just spread that all over it. Oh, some, some accidentally got on my finger. Look at that. Mm. <laughs> and some of you all are saying, you know, I, I think we need to leave right now. I know what you're thinking. I, I, I know the thought process that goes through this. And, and when I started and I just showed you the bread, I didn't hear any noises. But now that I've gone through these five I'm hearing stomachs growl from Dixie Highway, Crestwood, Indiana, Blankenbaker, everywhere. Why? It's because these toppings, they just, they take us to a whole other level. Now, they're not real good for you, I'll be honest, okay? You're not going to have your doctor say, you need more cinnamon butter, all right? They're never going to say that. But they make something about the bread come alive. Now, hold this image. And let me tell you a story about Jesus. In the Gospel of John, whether you know it or not, there are seven different places where there are I am statements, where Jesus says an I am declaration, and he is letting the world know that he is deity, that he is God in the flesh. You know many of them. I am the light of the world, or I am the way, the truth, and the life, or I am the gate, or I am the vine, or I am the good shepherd. But one of them is I am the bread of life. And in John chapter 6, it is the longest chapter in the entire New Testament. But you may not remember the context and the setting in which he says this. You see, in John 6, Jesus begins that chapter by feeding the 5,000. Actually, it was 5,000 men, and it was probably 10 to 12,000 people that were there. And he did so with just five loaves of bread and two fish. It was an astounding miracle. It rocked their world. They could not get over this. And as you can imagine, that miracle in itself changed the course of Jesus' ministry. And the Gospel of John tells us that the crowds want to make Jesus Christ the king, overthrow the government. And if you think about it, you can see why. This, this guy is going to give us free food. We listen to his teaching. We get a front row seat to a meal and a miracle. This is pretty good stuff. But that night after he's taught, the disciples go into the boat, and Jesus goes up on a mountainside, and no one knows where he goes. The boat leaves, and when it gets dark, Jesus comes back down the mountain, and he walks across the water, and he joins some surprised disciples on their boat out on the Sea of Galilee. And then they go to Capernaum on the other side the next morning. Well, everybody is looking for Jesus on the other side, and now they find out, wait, somebody saw him in Capernaum this morning. There's no way he wasn't on the boat. And so now all of them, the crowds, they get in boats and they go across to Capernaum and they find Jesus because they want to make him their king. And Jesus sees them coming 
And he knows that their agenda is pretty evident and he's going to expose their ulterior motives. And in John chapter six, verse 26, Jesus says to them, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Busted. You see, Jesus realizes that they're more excited that they got something for nothing. And the free food has clouded their focus. And this discussion ensues. And as usually happens, the disciples, or in this case, this crowd of new followers of Jesus, they, they're thinking in physical terms. And Jesus is talking in spiritual terms. And the crowd just verbalizes what they really want. They want another serving of free food. Give us some more food. And in John 6, 34, they say, sir, always give us this bread. And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and you still do not believe. So here's an I am statement of Jesus proclaiming his deity. He's saying, you all are thinking about that food that I gave you. And that food satisfies you just for a few hours, and that's why you're back. But I am the one who can satisfy you and sustain you and provide for you for all eternity. I am the bread of life. And they're in this frenzy because they love the toppings more than they love the substance. They love the miracles more than they love the message or the messenger. That's so much more exciting. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. But we have this tendency to make it all about the jam and the honey and the apple butter. In verse 47, Jesus says, very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And Jesus then goes on with this crowd of people who have started following him, and he takes his teaching to a whole nother level in order to test their commitment, to see if they really want to follow him, to see if he really will be number one in their lives, above their families, above their livelihood, above their other pursuits, above their desire for miracles and excitement. And so he's bringing them to decision time. Are you in or are you out? Are you on the fence or are you with me? To put it another way, he looks at them and says, would you like some bread with your honey? He says, because I'm right here. I'm the bread of life if you want me. And this power-packed chapter tells us that many who had been following Jesus and enjoying his miracles, that on that day, at that moment, they walked away from him. And they left Jesus. Because in that moment, it became crystal clear that they wanted the temporary toppings more than they wanted the bread. Hey, I'm telling you, in American Christianity, There is such a correlation when it comes to our commitment level or our fading commitment level. We get so wrapped up in the benefits and and, in the toppings. And so for some, if if they don't feel warm fuzzies during worship or if, if their prayers aren't answered the way that they think God should answer them or if reading the Bible feels tedious to them or if there's not sports opportunities like they think that their church should have for them or if tithing feels intrusive, or if the children's programming isn't the style that they prefer, then they lose interest because their faith is so immature. And so at times we choose our churches based on the toppings. And if we aren't careful, pretty soon Jesus becomes secondary and the gospel message isn't as important as our preferences and the bread takes a back seat. God will do whatever it takes to convince us that his son is the only thing that can truly satisfy, that he is the bread of life. And maybe that's why next month in December, we will celebrate that God came to earth and was born in Bethlehem. You remember what Bethlehem means? House of bread. God is begging us not to miss this. So if you are visiting today, 
What you need to know about this church is not how many campuses we have, not where the student ministry is going on their next trip, not how much square footage there is here, not the style of preaching, not the style of worship, not the style of dress. What you need to know is that scripture is our standard and that Jesus Christ is our savior and we will lift him up unapologetically. And while our methods will constantly change, our message will never change. That Jesus is the bread of life and he is the only one who satisfies completely. May we hunger and thirst for him. Let's pray. Jesus, what a powerful name it is. Lord, you satisfy and you sustain, you protect and you provide. At the end of John 6, uh, Lord, you, you looked at your disciples and said, are, are, are you going to desert me too? And may we answer with Simon Peter who looked at you and said to Lord, to whom would we go? For we believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Lord, forgive us when we get more excited about the honey then we do the bread. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We wanna give you an opportunity to come to the only one who can satisfy and sustain, and that's Jesus Christ. And we wanna give you that opportunity. We'd love to kind of walk through that with you and let you know kind of what that means and entails. There are others of you who have already made a commitment to Christ and it's a good time for you to say, man, I, I'm not a part of this church family, but I, th I think this is where God's calling me to, to be a member. And maybe you need to make that commitment. Others of you, you need to say, I, I could use some prayer because uh, I haven't been depending on, on the Lord enough. Or maybe you just need prayer from somebody on our prayer team because of the fact that uh, you're having a hard time right now with that provision piece. So whatever it is that's on your heart, if you've got a decision, you need to make or you need someone to pray with you. Meet me down front as we stand together and worship.